So this is a really fun uh, deep dive into a research question using the Ringling Archives. Um, and it's presented to us by Peggy Williams, who is a staff member of the archives, but also has a pretty fascinating history outside of her uh, archival life. Uh, and I'm gonna let her uh, share a little bit of that with you. So I'm gonna just turn it over to Peggy and Peggy, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you. And thank you all for tuning in. This is exciting. Um, so can, can you all hear me? Not? Okay, good, good. So here we go. Um, you can see my first screen. Here we are going to be exploring the Ringling archives. And welcome to the Ringling. We hope you enjoy your time today. I think you'll, you'll find out some things you did not know about the Ringling archives. Also how to access a, a, a way to, to get there even from home with research questions if you have some. Um, I believe you probably know a lot about the surface. So the archives, the actual archives is located in the upper level of the Tibbles building where, they, where the model is. And if you've never been to the Ringling, you'll have to go there someday because you're going to <laughs> learn a lot about what you can see there, okay? Uh, let me see. Uh, the, the archive staff is, is small. Some of them are actually on with us the, today. It's small in number, but they share we share, all of us, a huge responsibility. Collectively, we have stewardship of well over a million items in the archives, a million, well over it, uh, part of the many unique collections which are housed there. So these items have a date range, at least for the circus part, that spans over three centuries. And uh, that's just the circum circus items alone. The scope of the collections, include a lot more than what I'm going to share with you, but at least circus, then the allied arts, Wild West shows and sideshows. It also includes the historical documents of the museum itself, including the Cadizan, the Art Museum, Circus Museum, the Tibbles Learning Center, the historic Oslo Theater at the Visitor Center, and a lot more. All the buildings on the campus have a history somewhere in our archives. So there's a wide variety of items from which we can research. Uh, the photos uh, show you, I'm going to change a uh, scene now. The photos show you, how do I get rid of that screen here? I guess I have to close that part right here we go. There we go. These photos are actually taken inside the archives. We very rarely take pictures in there. We look at pictures all the time in there. Um, and these are people that have visited the archives. They might be students from uh, some of the local colleges. They might be researchers who are looking for something very specific. And we have uh, ways to show them how not to touch things and how to touch things. And some things we don't touch much at all. They're so rare and they're so fragile. But uh, nevertheless, um, we love it when the students are interested in, you know, what goes on in an archives and we can show them. On the left upper hand corner, you see uh, some staff and students. Uh, David is in there. Um, the, the middle picture on the top is Heidi Connor. She's our, our chief archivist. Next to her, the man in the black jacket is Ron Levere, and he does a lot of our digital, um, working with our digital things in the um, museum. He's an amazing man. Um, in the far right corner is Susan O'Shea. She is um, one of our newest full-time members. She just graduated from college not too long ago, and she is amazing and has learned the collection so quickly. And on the bottom are students and guests that are looking. Again, Heidi Connor in the lower left-hand corner. At any rate, um, they, they explain what archives are about and why do we collect records and what do the records at the Ringling, you know, what, where, what are the sources of those records? What do they tell us? And among all these staff members, they can figure out, we collectively as a team will figure out what's the best resource to go to when we get inquiries about finding information about anything along those lines in the circus and the allied arts and even the institutions and um, the Ringling history. So the purpose of our presentation today is to introduce you to some of the types of primary source documents that we have um, that are available for research. We'll show you how pulling together a bit from this one and a bit from that one can create an amazing story and really build a true historical perspective of a person, place, time, or an event. 
So every, <clears throat> every week at the archives, we get research requests from people all over the world who are hoping we have some answers for them. They wanna know something, they're hoping that we can help them find it. Some requests come by phone, others by mail or email or via our online inquiry form, uh, which I'll show you later in the presentation, how you can get onto ringling.org and find that form and put your request in as well. Uh, today, we're gonna look at a recent research request that, that we have and, and show you uh, what we found that helps tell the story about uh, the person whose name we did not have, that we were looking for, and we not only found his name, but we found out a whole lot about his life with, with the uh, Barnum and Bailey Circus. And while we do that, you'll notice the circus has its own culture and its own language. I was introduced to many words and phrases and experiences through a part of that unique circus culture by virtue of a job that I had. I'm not a trained archivist. Um, I am the archives assistant at the Ringling, which means I get to learn about everything that we're working on as we work on it and uh, learn about the collections and everything and also bring my knowledge uh, to bear. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm Peggy Williams and I'm the archives assistant. And uh, while I'm not a professionally trained archivist, I have a great interest and love for all things circus, particularly the experiences that I had uh, in my 48 years with Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey. Um, I appreciate circus in all forms for the artistry the circus and its people share with audiences around the globe. I understand it because I was part of it. I had kind of a varied career, not what my parents thought would happen when I graduated from college, because my next place to go was to Clown College for my graduate work at Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Clown College in Venice, Florida, just down, down the coast here. I understand it because I was part of it. And subsequently, when I finished Clown College, I was offered a contract for my dream job. So I did, yes, I did run away and join Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. I lived on a train. I met people who speak languages I'd never heard. And I um, experienced a lot of cultures getting together and getting it done. We have a thing that we do. I don't know if you can see my hands. Okay, here. We have a thing that we, okay, get along or get along, right? So in the circus, it's about teamwork and collaboration and getting along, making the show happen every day, twice on some days and three times on Saturdays. And so we had that experience. It was amazing. Um, I would, uh, I, you know, I love the circus people and, and because a, a few attributes to circus people, I care if they're working in an arena show or a tent show or an open air show, one of the attributes that they all have is the daily pursuit of excellence in their performance. Um, they also have the daily suit, pursuit of excellence in the logistics that gets them from town to town and the long term planning that gets them around the country or around the world. And also, which I witnessed a lot, the immediate resilience that they have to short-term challenges when they come up. Those short-term challenges could be bad weather, it could be a tent blow down, it could be a train being laid, it could be anything. But everybody gets together and makes whatever can happen, happen. And they just do it innately. It's part of the circus culture. So we're, we're going to uh, be happy to know that circus people are really, really super when it comes to figuring it out. Uh, and I'm also grateful for the Ringling Museum because the Ringling Museum, now that many of the circuses are not out there and working, the Ringling Museum has an amazing role in recording and preserving the circus arts for future generations to learn about. So during my, uh, during my circus time, um, I got to perform for the first 10 years as a performing clown. Later on, I became um, uh, I worked in the production team. I was assistant performance director, and I also uh, became a performance director. Then I worked in the marketing team, and I did education outreach for the circus with about 38,000 teachers around the United States and telling them about the circus. So I've had, I've looked at it from a few different angles, and I love all of them. Um, and I guess I'm going to show you. Here's what I wore to work. Whoops. There we go. On the left-hand side, is a spectacle float. Now, there's a lot of circus words I'm gonna throw at you today. Spectacle's one of them. The spec, 
is the big production number in the show. It's a thematic number. It has costumes and floats and props and flags and banners and, and you name it. And it's all focused on a theme. Some of the spectacles from the early circus days were just amazing. Um, and and they, some of them even came from biblical or historical things. The spectacle that I worked at, this one was a celebration of Mardi Gras. So everything in the spectacle, which was the number that animals and people, everyone who was in the cast had also a role in the spectacle. So I was, lucky me, I got to be the queen of the spectacle. I'm the one sitting in that beautiful orange float with a lot of hair on my head. As you can see, it's not my normal hairstyle. Um, and my performing partner, the, the, the clown standing there, the white face clown, I also was a white face, uh, is Dwayne Thorpe, and he was my performing partner for this amazing costume. It weighed over 30 pounds, the costume itself, and the number of shows that we did, because each tour we would take for two years, was over a thousand shows. So I wore that costume over a thousand times, and in between, uh, in between wearing it, there were beads or buttons or little mirrors or spangles, all these hand-sewn beautiful things that were created in our, our wardrobe department. Uh, and uh, we also had outside people helping with that. Um, if they were coming loose, they'd fix them because we wanted the show to look the same way at the very end of the um, tour as it did the first day of the tour, spanking brand new, it wanted to look. So a thousand times I wore that costume and, and had a lot of fun with that number. So we celebrated the Mardi Gras and the choreography was like Mardi Gras would be and all the props and the flags and banners and all those things, even elephant blankets, they were all themed for the Mardi Gras. And then each production had a different theme for the spec. So you can see a lot of those things. If you go to the, um, the, the, the circus photo collections at ringling.org and click on collections and then go to the online collections, you can see a lot of different photos of specs and other numbers from the past. So while we're, um, looking to these things. I mean, the spec is loud and boisterous and moving. There's animals going up and down, things moving across the spectrum of the three rings. Um, there are also times that require really quiet moments, not only in the show, but before the show. And I'm gonna just share one of those with you. It kind of reminds me of the archives. The archives has over a million things. How do you know where to start to look? How do we know where to start to look when we get a request? Well, let's, um, let's look at this. This is one of those quieter times. This little girl whose name I never did find out or remember, I guess. <laughs> she and I had a meeting before the show. She was in a, a kind of a lobby area that had a plant and it had a, 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 a banister that she was hanging on to there. And she told me that she had never seen a clown before. Well, imagine my responsibility. I was feeling I had to really make it work for her because this was the first time she was an audience member for the circus. She was the first time that she saw a clown and first time she talked to a clown. And she was telling me all about this yellow flower. And I listened intently because that was a very special moment for me and also for her because she was about to go into the circus, which is gonna change her life. So I love the quiet moments in the circus and there's a lot of them even within, within the context of the performance of the show. But let's, um, let's talk about the research requests we wanna look at today because um, I think it's amazing in a very short amount of time we were able to find a whole lot of things and build a story. The research request itself was this. It was a person of significant importance to a tented, a traveling tented circus. It was a specific time period. It was the turn of the century, last time, from 1897 to 1901. There was a specific circus mentioned. That would be the Barnum and Bailey, the greatest show on earth. During that time, they were in Europe. They were doing a five-year European tour. And we wanted to find out who was responsible for putting up taking down and moving a canvas city of 16 tents five to six times a week for the entire five-year tour of Europe. So where do we start? Okay, there's some really awesome, awesome um, assets that we have in the, um, 
in the archives and um, the seven collections, there's many collections of different types of things and I used seven collections. It was the collection of circus records, the ledgers, those are the financial uh, money, money issues of a show. The Tibble's circus collection of programs, of program books. Um, they vary, but they always have something amazing. And it was this one that happened to be very useful. We'll show you in a second. The Tibble Circus collection of route books. If you've ever been on a circus, don't. You, the route books are very, very valuable for memories. But um, when we go down a little further on the list, there's something that was even more valuable for finding out where we go in tomorrow. And the Tibble Circus collection of tickets, passes, and coupons. So we'll show you what a circus ticket looked like in France in 1902. Uh, the Tibble Circus collection of route sheets. That's what you never want to lose if you're on tour. If you're in a circus that moves every day or every other day, it's the route sheet that tells you what the name of the building is or the name of the city or the railroad you're going to use to get there if you're a railroad train uh, at circus. Um, and it's amazing. And I'll show you one of those. And the Tibble Circus collection of circus records. This would be like correspondence, contracts, all kinds of paper records that tell more of the story behind the scenes. And we'll show you one of those. And the Tibble Circus collection of photographs. So we're gonna go right to one of the best sources, a program. You've probably been to a circus, you've seen a program book, you look at the pictures, you look at the, maybe there's names listed in there. Uh, maybe there's a history of the performers, all those things. and. <clears throat> the, um, the programs are very, very important. What do they do? We, uh, we, we know that programs contain a record of the people and the acts and the animals in a show. That's a basic. And this unique program I'm going to show you here uh, captures more than most. This program from that five-year tour featured an overhead diagram of the layout of the circus lot photographs of uh, the interior of the menagerie tent. There's another circus word you want to write down if you don't know what that is. We'll talk about the menagerie in a moment. Featured performers and staff and stories of incidents that occurred during the tour and the running order of the performances sometimes are in the program. This is the 1901 program <clears throat> and um, this is when they were performing in France and um, this is uh, from the circus collection of programs. It even says on the cover the price. It says price 50 cent, C-E-N-T period. That doesn't mean cents, pennies. It means centimes. Centime is a, uh, 50 centimes is a half of a franc. So that's what a program book would cost uh, back then. Let me take a sip here. Okay. In that program book, we found some amazing things. First of all, we found the title page, which says, when translated from the French, all rights of reproduction and translation reserved. Official guide, the book of wonders of the greatest show on earth of Barnum and Bailey. Detailed descriptions of the phenomena and human prodigies and curious animals by Clarence L. Dean, editor and proprietor of Barnum and Bailey. So this is amazing. Now Barnum, of course, had already passed away by this time. Um, it was about 10 years after he had passed away that this uh, program is pertinent to the show, but Barnum and Bailey was the name of the show. So he's always going to be there in spirit, if not in person, <laughs> right? Okay. 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 So moving on, here's that wonderful, wonderful overhead shot of the lot layout. <clears throat> it's written in French, but I'm going to point out a few things. I do want you to look at the overall layout. The tents, of course, were rounded. They weren't, you don't see many square tents except for the really small ones, which might have been a concession or a ticket or were oval. If you look at the one right in the middle of that layout, that is the Pavilion de Menagerie. Menagerie is a French word. It means a collection of animals. It also means a place where a collection of animals might live. So that's the menagerie tent. I'm gonna show you how the traffic went from the audience coming in to the animals coming in and to the people going and getting into their wardrobe and then entering the, uh, the big top. Below that middle tent there, that oval tent, 
is the big top. Now, Ringling Brothers, or Barnum and Bailey is known, uh, the three ring circus, but there's also two stages in there. If you look at those five items in the middle of that, they had three rings and two stages, one between each pair of rings. And so there was so many things going on. So let's look at how the audience came in. Oh, I want to point out one thing too. Between that middle oval tent and the big top, which is of course the biggest tent on the lot, the bathrooms were located in between those two tents. So if you went, we were coming in and you were in the menagerie tent to see the animals and then you would, you would pass the bathrooms. Now there's a circus word for bathrooms too. You may not know this, but you may. It's called Donnerkers. And the Donnerkers were what circus people still refer to as the bathrooms. You know where the Donnerker is? You know they're a circus person, if they say that phrase. Those are located just in between. The, the, the text is really teeny in there. You can't read it. But that's where the rows, the gentleman on the left and the uh, ladies on the right, and that's where the bathrooms were. So let's look <clears throat> at how the traffic came in. Upper left-hand corner, that's where the cast came in. Whoops. How did we get there? Okay, so these are uh, uh, vestiaire de dame and vestiaire de messer, that's men's and women's wardrobe in today's version, and um, any other kind of costumes that might go on animals and stuff because it's so close to the, um, it's so close to the menagerie tent where the animals were. Up at the top, that tent up at the top is elephants and horses. So it's, it's actually a horse tent. They had two kinds of horses uh, on the circus. One, they had a whole set of working horses. These were strong, they were, they were trained to pull, they were, they were built to be uh, working horses. They would pull things at the train. Yes, Barnum and Bailey did take their train on a ship all the way over to Europe for that five-year tour. And that's where their performers stayed and slept in. And that's where they had all the elements of the cookhouse and that's where they got supplies and everything but they did take their train. There's, there's a beautiful picture in the archives uh, about them lifting a train off of a ship to put it on a track. And that was, um, uh, that was really cool. So the audience, the audience comes in over here in the right-hand corner, right? It says, entree principal. So that's the principal entrance and that goes right into the menagerie tent. Um, in addition to that, they of course have to pass the ticket, the ticket, uh, the guichet au billet, <laughs> the ticket uh, areas were right there in those two small boxes, and they had to pass the concessions, and why not? As we were, all these areas, and, and if you think about it, if you've been to a tented show recently, you do enter the same way. You enter, you may see some animals on display or some performers doing something, but you also see the ticket wagon and the concessions on your way in and then you end up in the big top. Okay, so um, I think that I didn't, whoops, sorry, went the wrong way. The performance tent, there we go. That's where they all end up. And there's chairs and each chair has a row number and a seat number on it. And we'll look at the ticket that they had from the uh, show in France. And we can see where the person who owned that ticket actually sat. Um, by the description on the tickets. It was not festival seating. Okay, so we're going to move forward. Now, if you're not familiar with the tents and haven't been to a tented circus recently, if you ever can, do, do go because it's an amazing experience. This is a sample. This is the, the model from uh, the Howard Tibbles building at the Ringling. And this is the, the Tibbles Learning Center. This is his model that he's worked for decades on. And this model is amazing. And you can walk around the entire model uh, when you're at the Tibbles. It's on the first floor of the Tibbles Learning Center. And you can see how the tents are put up, how they're located. It's not exactly the same as the, uh, the Barnum and Bailey layout from the turn of the century, but it has all the tents. It has a menagerie tent. And we'll, we'll get to peek at that just a little bit later. So we're gonna go back to some photos from yesteryear. Now I have to say, many of the things I'm showing you actually came out of the, the program books and uh, the route books. Um, some of these photos came from a little bit later date, but it shows how they would set up the tent. And you can see in this picture, over in the right-hand uh, third, 
you can see all the stakes that are already pre-laid out. Over at the edge on the right, you can see where the um, canvas has been pulled and set in place. <clears throat> and and uh, we'll get a little further into that. Uh, they had to do this every day. Now this man, we're looking for his, we're looking for his name. Uh, we know what his job is and he has a huge team because they had to put up the performance tent and all the other tents every day and then take it down, roll the canvas up properly, pack it away in the, in the, in the storage uh, wagons properly so that when they got to tomorrow's town, they could unroll it perfectly and know where things go so that they didn't have to waste any time wondering. They had a set pattern. So when the rolls were set, here's the guys. Um, and this is from, oh, this is from, I think, no, late 30s, this picture. But you can see this is a hands-on job. They are all pulling the canvas and they're all um, in sync with each other. They all keep their eyes on what's going on on all parts of the tent. Prior to doing that, on the left-hand side, you can see that they're lacing the tent up and now you can see the poles, the circus poles. Uh, there's six of them. On the right-hand picture, you can see all six. Those poles are strategically placed and the canvas is attached to the bail rings that go around the poles that, that get hoisted up actually when the canvas starts getting lifted. Those men on the right-hand side are doing that. The other man in the horizontal line, kind of in the middle of the picture, they're lacing the canvas pieces together and they're all doing it like clockwork. They know exactly what they need. They have all their tools right there. They've checked out the lot to make sure there's no bumps or rocks or anything or they wouldn't be pulling the canvas over it. That you don't see in a photo where they check out the lot to make sure it's good for performance because they're putting up the place where the show's gonna take place. Okay, on the left-hand side, you can see they've, that they've done their lacing and um, there are many, many ropes that have to, be, have to be accurately twisted and tied together or are tied to a stake because uh, you don't want knots where you don't want knots. And so they had an amazing thing. And in the right-hand picture, you can see that they've actually, so in the left-hand picture, uh, one of the phrases that has been shared with me about when a tent starts going up like that and they start putting in those poles at the edge of the tent, the side poles, they, they kind of refer it to as the tent starts to breathe now because it's getting life in it. It's gonna react to wind and things. And so it begins to, to breathe. On the right-hand picture, you're gonna see um, men handling those tent poles and putting it up. And guess what? They have an audience all around the left-hand side of the picture. I don't know if they had orange cones, but that's what we'd have today. All around the audience came to see them put up the tent. It was an amazing, amazing thing. Always will be. When you see a tented circus, you know someone put it up and it didn't just snap their fingers. They worked really hard and they did it right the first time. Here we go. Other thing that's really interesting about some of these large poles, um, you can see eight men. You may not be able to see all of them, but I counted the feet and there's 16 feet. So there's eight men that strike with these sledgehammers. They strike the top of this pole and they do it in a cadence and a rhythm that is so um, interesting to watch. You can see the audience on the other side, even the little kids are mesmerized because they're hearing each, they're hearing each hammer hit the pole, the stake, this big stake, and it becomes a cadence. And if the cadence gets disrupted, they all know to, to look and, and, and stop. And, you know, because maybe someone dropped a hammer or whatever, not very often, I don't think, but it was all about teamwork. So they would go either counterclockwise or clockwise. I've heard it both ways. So it probably was the team's preference. And it took those eight people to pound that big stake in while their pachyderm assistant over on the side is holding yet another stake. She's, she's an assistant. And um, that's exactly what I have seen many, many trained Asian elephants do. They assist in acts. They'll pick up a prop. They'll pick up a paintbrush and make a painting. They're amazing. Amazing. So, okay. Now this goes back again to the turn of the century. This is a photo from the uh, program book. Um, and it's the interior of the menagerie. You can see on the right-hand side, it's a little faded picture and the, you know, the document's 120 years old. So this is the best photo we could get of it. And we have two humped and one humped camels. We have zebras way down at the far end. You have elephants 
And on the left-hand side, you have wagons parked one after another. When you see what this does, and this goes up every day and the animals get in there, all this happens in a place where yesterday was a vacant lot. It's amazing to me that that is the case. All right, we're going to move along here. If you can't see that happen, <laughs> and go back to 1902, um, you can see it at the, at the Ringling. This is Howard Tibbles in the menagerie tent. You can see the wagons lined up on one side. It makes a, makes a nice perimeter. And you can see all the lacing. You can see the stakes. You can see the ceiling of the tent. You can see the poles for the top where the flags are. The um, elephants are in the back right corner. And when you go there, I challenge you, count how many elephants are in that menagerie tent and you would just be totally amazed. So um, this is a great place to visit. You can learn so much by going to that model and learning and wondering, how did they do it? Okay, so this is a route book. This is a blue leather bound route book. This contains the entire route for five years of the European tour. They called it Barnum and Bailey in the Old World, 1897 to 1901. <clears throat> uh, technically, they were there a little longer than that, uh, complete with maps of the countries traveled during the tour. We know they were there longer than that because we have a circus ticket from 1902 in France. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, um, this has made it pretty well, 120 years, I think, right? So the route book is an invaluable tool. It contains the name and the full title of the person that we're looking for. His name is prominently displayed at the top of the listing of the heads of departments. And there he is, John Burke. We found his name. We didn't know who we were looking for. We knew what he did and he was, and we now you know his title, the superintendent of Canvas. Very cool. So, um, so now we have a name and a title. We have a place, a location. We know that tour was in Europe. We're gonna learn a little bit more about specifically where. But the next thing is ledgers. This is so interesting. A ledger is a financial record of the show on tour. These are big, heavy books with lots of lines in them. The Barnum and Bailey record of finances, 1901 to 1902, is what it says on the label, on the front of the, on the front of the cover, which is, um, it, it's, it's gracefully aging. The cover is it's very delicate. When we turn the pages, we're very careful, and we will find out from inside here not only what John Burke's title was. It'll be reiterated, but also that his salary and how he was paid and when he was paid and in what currency he was paid. So here we go. We have different dates in here. If you can see at the top, it says John Burke, superintendent, SUPT, superintendent of Canvas. And you look at the left-hand side, the page number is 66 and so is the right-hand side. This full open thing is page 66 and it's all about John Burke. We see dates on here. We see salaries on here you can see that's a, those are in francs he made approximately 100 francs a week there must have been something special going on on the bottom week because he got 200 francs and then there was one week where he got 75 francs so we're not sure the variation there but the average was 100 francs a week we also know when the tour ended because we got his last paycheck salary here and he was there from November 18th, 1901 to October 26, 1902, okay? So he made 26,000 francs per year. That's what that says at the bottom of that. So um, it's amazing. Amazing that we know that much from a ledger. So we have more information to learn simply about the show itself. Um, there's a collection of circus records and the circus records include things like contracts, um, correspondence, many other things, a lot of paper records. And we found one, not because it talks about John Burke so much, but about the letterhead. Okay, so this is a letter uh, from 1900, and it was uh, a, a correspondence from James A. Bailey, who signed it at the bottom, to Septimus Dixon Esquire. 
and it was about the payment of the lot rent during the tour that they were there. He wanted to make sure that everything, and he was, he's talking in there about a check. But the most interesting part to me was how they used the logo as, um, they used the logo as something that was advertising basically. And I'm gonna find for you what the logo says. You can't read it from where you are. There's a lot of text in there. Of course, there's a picture of Barnum on the left and Bailey on the right. That's a, I think that's a sketch. Um, they're beautiful sketches. And let me, see, let me find the exact list of things that are there because it's awesome. All right. So it includes a sketch of Barnum and Bailey. And on the right hand side of the letterhead, there's some text, right? There's a scroll kind of design at the bottom of that at the top too. So the right hand side states things about the show itself. 70 cars, four trains, tents covering 18 acres, 1200 people employed, 1000 living wonders, 400 horses, 100 cages of wild beasts, a great traveling world's fair. And then underneath the P.T. Barnum and James A. Bailey banner there that says all new every year, it says conducted on sound business principles, morals, instructive, highly conducted, honorably presented, truthfully advertised, the real source of all the best amusement ideas. So indeed it was advertising, but it was also bragging rights because the Barnum and Bailey show had a very good reputation and they wanted to keep it that way. Um, on the list on the left hand side are all their offices. It says American Winter Quarters in Bridgeport, Connecticut, English Winter Quarters in Stoke on Trent, London, the New York office in New York City, the London office in England, and on the very top line, very, very top line of that of that letterhead, which takes about a third of the page, it says the world's largest, grandest, best amusement institution. So that is the letterhead. Barnum and Bailey had a reputation to uphold. They were a circus from America traveling in Europe and having great success. You can see it all in their letterhead, a grand exhibition of superlative language. I love the language on circus posters as well. You can find superlative language there. It's just amazing. All right, so now we have some circus phrases that are part of the, part of the language of the circus too. You may have heard of these before. Some of them certainly you have, and others may be a little curious. The first one is make your nut. In, in, um, in the circus terms, making your nut means did you make enough money for your expenses? Because you, your cash comes in day by day, you know. Um, you want to be able to make your expenses, but the story behind the nut part of it is interesting. The make your nut, it is, um, well, there were some, let's say there were some circuses that kind of followed in the wave of advertising for other circuses and kind of day and dated, which is another phrase we could put on there, but it means they played, they took advantage of someone else's advertising to get people to come to their circus because you see a circus tent, you think that's the one advertised, right? But the, um, the make your nut part is some sheriffs would see these same smaller circuses come around year after year and they were warned that the bills from the prior year weren't paid before the show took off. So they had a, a policy where you, they would, after the show was set up, someone from the sheriff's department would come by and take a few um, nuts off the wagon wheels and they would lock them up. And when the expenses were paid that night before the show pulled out, they'd have to make their nut back so that they could take all their wagons with them. That's the way I've heard this story. I've heard it told a few different ways, but make your nut was the phrase that came from that true experience. Another one is jump on the bandwagon. Two weeks ago, jump on the bandwagon was the phrase needed for a Jeopardy question. <laughs> and they said, because of the musicians on the Barnum show and the Barnum and Bailey Circus, that they, um, uh, had that phrase jump on the bandwagon and the musicians would ride the bandwagons in the daily street parade from the from the train to the tented area wherever it was or in a parade grandstanding is another one that's where people go to be seen right that happens all the time in public arenas today and in public places 
And it certainly was something that they did. Sometimes it was politicians. Sometimes it was, uh, you know, famous people in the, in the land. And uh, they would, yeah, hold babies. They would shake hands. They would even kiss babies. Another one is throw your hat in the ring. I've heard two generation generational um, ideas for this, but I know uh, for sure they used to have boxing on Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. They used to have boxers that travel with the show. And if you wanted to come as a citizen, come and box, the, the legend goes that you could throw your hat in the ring and you could uh, try to beat the boxer from the show. I don't know a lot about that, but that's one of them. The other one is politicians would come and be able to start their show by throwing the hat in the ring. So um, that one has two sources, but you have heard that before. Certainly now it's a political phrase that we're all very familiar with. Very, very. Okay, another one is hold your horses. Hold your horses is only half the story. The hold your horses, when you say it now, you mean, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't go so fast, let's take it easy, hold your horses. But this phrase is the first half of the sentence that a man on a horse at the beginning of the street parade would say to the people who had ridden their horses to town to see the circus. They would say, hold your horses, the elephants are coming. And, and what they meant was tie them up because horses are not used to smelling elephants. And you know, horses have great nostrils. They're smelling things all the time. Um, they, they may not like the smell of an elephant, they might spook from it. So, so another one, that I wanted to add to this list. Uh, no, I'll wait till we do the, um, there's a few uh, words that we'll do at the end. Because um, we, we want to get through this so we can have time for your questions, yeah. So uh, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat and um, they'll be monitored and we can answer them. If there's duplicate questions, we can answer them in just a few moments. Um, or I'll show you another way if you have questions that would require uh, more than we can do on a Zoom, I'll show you how to use the inquiry sheet that's on ringling.org. Okay, so route sheets. This is the most important single piece of paper I ever had when I was on the show. I was on a show that traveled by train. It was Ringling Brothers and Barman Bailey, but every show had route sheets because it tells you where you were yesterday, where you are today, and where you're going. This is the France 1902 route sheet the official route of Barnum and Bailey Greatest Show on Earth. It has five columns. I don't expect you can read those. I'll tell you what the columns mean though, and then we can dissect the information. The date is the first column on the left, and this goes from April 27th to May 31st, 1902. The town is the next column, and that is where you're gonna play, where the show's gonna play. It starts out with Nice, which is in France. In fact, all of these cities on this one are all in France. Uh, it has uh, Montpelier, it has uh, Toulouse, it has Bordeaux, uh, it has all these amazing, Limoges is, is the bottom one, and then uh, the country's in the middle, and of course it's all um, France, otherwise another country would be written in there, and what railway you took to get there, so right there for those, what is it, 30 some days, they used uh, five different railroads in France, and Everything that has quotation marks underneath it is a ditto, basically a ditto of, they used it for those many places. But look at every single line practically, except Bordeaux, which has seven or eight, has eight days where they played there. That must have been a wonderful thing to be able to play somewhere for eight days because they were moving pretty fast. So that's France in 1902. What they did on their days off, I think laundry. I don't think that's changed a bit. There's three buckets and a washboard. This man is doing his laundry and three buckets and a washboard outside the tent. The ladies are doing tent to tent clotheslines and they're smiling so happily. I love it. But you have to do your laundry, right? When laundromats weren't hanging up back then. <laughs> so today I think people would probably go to the local laundromat um, or maybe even have a beautiful motor home that they travel in and have a wash machine in it, but not those days. Buckets, washboards, and a good line. Okay, here's Austria and Hungary, 1901. So we're going back a year. And you can see the dates on the left and the, uh, the towns, almost every day they changed location, except when they were in Prague uh, and Brun. So 
um, and they use about what seven, eight, nine different railroads. And um, so these are faded. It's really hard to see. It's hard to see when you hold them in your hand too. So you can hold them carefully and you don't touch them with your hand. <laughs> Use a glove. These are very fragile. And then sometimes, you know, when you move so fast that you don't remember where you were yesterday, if any of you have been on a circus or even, even a world tour where you, they take you somewhere different every day and by the end of the first week, you don't know where you were uh, or, or where you're going tomorrow. A really common thing that people that visit circus lots ask is, where are you going from here? And this is Otto Griebling. He has a long history in Sarasota. He was not on the show uh, at, at the turn of the century. He was only five years old then. <laughs> so, um, but he, he, he toured America and he had this phrase that he used when people said, well, where are you going from here? And they would, he would say, tomorrow's town. And inevitably the people would say, Morristown, that's in New Jersey. That's a long way from here. I've never been there. I heard it's beautiful. And he'd go, mm hmm Every time he would say Morristown. Sometimes the clowns would set him up. The clowns that I worked with in the alley, uh, when I first started clowning, they were older in their career and they had worked with Otto. And they said, yep, he always said Morristown. Interesting story about a lovely man. And I believe he's trying to tell the duck on the left-hand side where they're going tomorrow. I'm not sure, but I think if I can channel the duck, I think that's what's going on there. On the right-hand side, he's doing what everybody in the circus does on move-out night, and they had move-out nights like every day. He's checking the lot to make sure nothing's left behind. You can see this tent is still up, but the wagons are lined up, and this is these photos are available uh, in the circus archives uh, if you look in the, um, the photo collections. Tickets, passes, and coupons. Okay, here comes how we know about the show itself. This is one ticket for one seat on a Sunday matinee on the March 30th, and it's 1902, right? That was the, that was the, the last spring they spent um, there. So we know that John has been doing, doing his job, putting the tent up, taking it down for all of these things for five years, right? He and his crew and hardworking circus people for the, so that maybe one child who sat in this seat saw the circus for the first time. This, this seat happened to be in section J, range G, or row G, uh, and the second chair in. So that's what the tickets look like. Not unusual for, for tickets, just um, that, that it lasts 120 years is amazing. Okay, meet John Burke. We found a picture of the guy we didn't even know his name. This is John Burke, superintendent of Canvas. And this was from the route book. They had pictures in the route book of some of the leaders of the different teams on the circus, whether it was front of house or, or the ring stock or the train or whatever, they had them all listed. And John Burke was in the middle of a page that's prominent. And um, that's what he looked like. He cleans up pretty good, right? <laughs> Okay, so we're getting ready for those circus words. And then if you have any questions, get ready because we're going to take those in just a second. The spectacle we talked about, the big production number, right? The big top, the biggest tent on the lot. Menagerie, the animals. It's where the animals and the people who care for them are all the time. The Donikers. Who doesn't need a Doniker from time to time, right? Tomorrow's town. That's Otto's favorite phrase. The bucket brigade, that's cleaning, you know, you, you had so many buckets and you had so many buckets full per day and you had to figure out the pecking order of how to use what was in the bucket. I mean, if from brushing your teeth to washing your clothes to washing your, your whatever, um, the bucket brigade. If you look at the model in the Tibbles Center, you will see buckets everywhere a bucket with your name on it. You look in the Clown Alley area, every clown had a bucket and their names on it, right? Because you don't want to lose your bucket. That's a personal item. And um, I wanted to talk about Straw House. When you sell out, you do what is called a Straw House sometimes, depending. They would bring in bales of straw for people additionally to sit on if the chairs were all taken. Now I've heard that sometimes they leave the straw in the bale and people sit on that. I've heard other times they spread the straw out on the ground if there's room inside the tent. So I don't know uh, who decides that, but 
the straw house is what everybody in show business knows. Yeah, and especially in the circus business, that it was a good date. And then you had the, the cook house and the pie car. Uh, in the Tibbles model, you can see a guy flipping about 24 pancakes on one grill. Must have been done because he fed thousands of people, right? Okay, so would you like to do some research on anything? We can help you. And maybe it's a place, a time, a person, an event, a show, or a relative. Well, let us know. We can help you find the resources. We are a research facility. And how do we do that? Well, you send your research questions to us online via our archives inquiry form. I'm going to show you what, where to find that on our website, ringlink.org. And what you do is you fill it out. There it is. Um, you go to ringling.org, then you go to collections and click on archives. And when you click on archives, you'll see this drop down menu on the left hand side. I'm sorry, it's light gray, but uh, uh, it's got the arrow pointing toward the form. And then where it says your contact information, that's the actual form. You start filling out, how do we get in touch with you by phone, by text, by email? Um, how, do, how does that happen for you? And what are you looking for? So the form goes on all the way down. Um, I want to just uh, say one thing that uh, is underneath that archives inquiry form on the left. It says resources, and those are additional resources, places you can look, other archives. Uh, that you can look for information if there's something that we can't find for you. Additional resources are there, and they're always adding to that. It's really, really cool. So when you've completed the entire form and provided as much information as possible, Scroll down to the bottom, click on the red tri uh, rectangle that says Submit Archives Inquiry. And then we have a surprise for you. But we, will, we will get that Archives Inquiry form into our e email boxes within five minutes. And our whole team will be looking to see, do we have anything to answer your questions or anyone else's? And coming soon, more information about how to research. This is called Research 101. It's coming soon. Uh, it's not up on the web yet. Um, a how-to introduction to research. It's presented by the John and Mabel Ringley Museum of Art Archives and Christopher Chris Bonadio, the assistant librarian over in the Ringling Library. And the narration is by Susan O'Shea from the Archival Collection Specialist from our team. We're really excited uh, to be offering these things because people want to research, they want to find things out, they don't know how to start. When this comes out, and you'll, you'll find out when because we'll let people know, um, this is another thing you may want to look at. Today we learned about some of the things in the archives and how we could find a story from that. And um, this is going to be, you know, how to organize your research and how you do it. So we're looking forward to that coming soon. Questions, comments? We're open for any questions that we came. Laura, we have anything on the chat? We do. Uh, so Josh is asking, uh, how do the million plus archived items break down by subject, i.e. circus, museum of art, Katazan, Ringling family? And then there's a second question, but I'll let you take that one first. Okay, well, there are, the archives are organized in collections. I mean, there's collections of route books. Some, like the Tibbles is a huge part of it because he has, he has been an amazing, uh, amazing donor for getting collections from around the world and pulling them all together. They're organized by um, either who donated them or the type of thing. I mean, there's posters, there's, they're organized very carefully and um, so that they're searchable. So if we know we have something, we can find out where it is in this huge expanse. Physically, they're organized all in one space uh, with very special humidity controls and temperature controls. And um, that part is not open to the public, um, but that that's where we do the research and bring the items um, to bear that answer the questions that the public is asking. And um, if you want to know more details, we'll have to have him do an inquiry form. We can get him a little bit longer answer for that. Okay. <laughs> and then the second part of his question, and maybe Susan or whoever else is on wants to jump in as well, is do archivists specialize or are they generalists across subjects? Wow, I think all of the above. Um, Susan, are you, are you able to speak, Susan? Susan O'Shea. I don't know. Can she? Can she? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> oh yeah. You want to answer that question, Susan? Um. So typically, 
we don't necessarily gener generalize. You can you can specialize in things. Um, for the most part, most archivists um, will be trained in archival theory, and that can be applied to any archives that you work in, whether it's a private institution or a public institution. Um, if you're working in an institution that's like a medical library or a special collection like that, you will probably have a degree in science of some kind so that you can better help um, understand the material you're working with, but it's not necessarily required um, for other archives. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank More you. questions? That was the only question that came through the chat, but if anyone's on the line and want to unmute yourself and just jump in, feel free. I have a question from early on in your presentation uh, where you were showing your costumes for the Mardi Gras floats. Yeah. Perhaps this is a bit off topic because uh, it's not paper, but I'm curious, within the ring lane, um, have you been able to preserve any of the, the costumes uh, from the circus history over the, over the years? Oh, there are a number of costumes that are housed uh, uh, in the Ringling facility. Yeah, some spectacle costumes, some personal costumes that have been donated by the artists themselves, wire walking shoes, 3D objects like that, there are. As far as those particular um, uh, costumes that I wore, they, they went back to Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey and are in the, um, in the warehouse there where they have many costumes that are preserved. In appropriate kind of lighting and temperature as well, and humidity controls. Yeah. And it looks like Josh maybe has another question. Josh, you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Uh, Peggy, I think you might have misunderstood my question. You talked in the beginning about a million plus items, and you seem mm -hmm. to focus on the circus. Does that million plus? Is that just for the circus? Because my question no, really is... No, no, no. A million plus, more than a million in the archives themselves. And some of them are records of the buildings and some of them are um, uh, records from the variety of the allied arts, the sideshows and um, all of that. Of, and, of that. of that million plus, what, how much would you say relates to the Museum of Art? Um, and Susan, do you, do you feel like you can jump in? I don't know what percentage, but we do have the archives of the art museum in the archives. Yeah. I don't know the percentage though, because you know, the percentage will continually change as more buildings are built, there's more records of buildings being built. Um, and we get, we also get, um, donations all the time that would change, you okay. know, whatever it is, but. So um, the chief archivist um, and I were just talking about this. Um, we'd say about 30% probably pertains to the art museum itself. Um, and that, incord, that includes like the governing board records, um, registrar records that we have, uh, photos, territorial records, that kind of stuff, facilities, maintenance. So I hope that answers Thank you. Well. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, well, hopefully Peggy now they're armed with the information about how to contact archives if they do have questions or if additional things come up. Um, Absolutely, have them fill out a, a, um, an inquiry form on the website and, and we will answer the question. Well, thank you so much, Peggy. This was a fun romp through uh, circus history and I appreciate you taking the time to share your knowledge with us. Thank you all for sharing your time today too on this. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. Bye everybody. You're very welcome. Bye. -bye.